Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy, and I am a compulsive overeater, and I'm abstinent today on the gray sheet. I weigh and measure three meals a day from the gray sheet without exception. I commit them to my sponsor. I don't eat no matter what, and abstinence is the most important thing in my life without exception. And I'm here today to build my defense against the first bite. On my own, I have no defense against that first bite. And um, it's great to hear so many people counting days. It brings me right back to when I came in. <clears throat> For most of my life, I had been, um, most of my life I was on a diet and I managed to you know, gain weight while I was dieting for most of my life. And at one point, the diet stopped working and I didn't know what was going on. My weight was going up and up and I was trying higher, harder and higher to diet, harder and harder. And I could not get past four o'clock on any given day. And I kept thinking, I just hadn't found the right diet, which actually was true because in my diet, I was, um, you know, including carbs. I would go through, I'm not going to eat any breakfast. I discovered that if I didn't eat any breakfast, I was okay until noontime and then I could have a salad. But then when I got home, my mind would take over and I would just binge through the night. But if I had the healthy American breakfast, which always included a carb, by 10 o'clock, I was starved out of my mind. And I didn't make the connection that the carb was making me hungry, but I did know if I if I didn't eat breakfast, I actually felt better. Um, anyway, what happened was I ended up getting a job and somebody was hired a month after me and she was a gray sheeter. And this was back, this was in um, Cambridge in July of 82, June of 82, June I guess. Anyway, in those days she gave me a gray sheet and she, said, go to a gray sheet. So the meetings are in Cambridge, go to a meeting. That's what she said, go to a meeting. Because I was following her around like a little puppy because none of my clothes were fitting. I was in kind of, you know, a, a job where I should be dressing, you know, I don't know what you would say, business nice or whatever the word is. And I was wearing jeans and old sweaters because nothing else fit. I was wearing my boyfriend's clothes. And um, she would say, I have followed her around because in those days it was pre-microwave and everything. And so she would come into work with a, a, a cloth placemat and a cloth napkin and a thermos with hot vegetables and pull out her chopsticks. And I was fascinated. First of all, her food looked delicious. It was a huge amount of food. And she was this normal, really, she sort of vibrated health. She was healthy and normal looking and always seemed to be in a good mood. Even if there was 10 staff meetings, she was always reasonable. <laughs> Who are you? And um, anyway, so she gave me one time she gave me this gray sheet said go to a meeting the meetings are in cambridge and i went to that meeting the first my first surrender i look back on it now and i realized when she said that i said okay and at that point i was doing nothing in my life by myself nothing not even i remember i used to love the sunday morning read the sunday morning paper and i couldn't do that anymore because that meant i had to go and buy it and then that meant i had to throw it away or do something with it and um, recycling had hit the States. And I was like, well, how do you recycle? What do you do? I don't know. I don't know. So I just didn't buy it. Anyway, um, I went to a meeting and I came away with two thoughts. The first thought was, I am much sicker than these people. Because in the preamble, it said you had to have 90 days or more to speak at a meeting, to qualify. And I thought, oh, these people, they do not eat the way that I do. They do not think about food the way that I do. We are not the same animal because I could not imagine. My best diet in all my life had been about two weeks, maybe. But most of the time, I could only do a couple of days. And at this point, for two years, I couldn't even get one day. And then I heard people sharing about having a disease. And I thought, oh, these poor people. I don't have a disease. I just need to lose weight. And so... I feel like I was kind of a poster child for what not to do if you want to get gray sheet abstinent. Because I took the gray sheet. The one thing I did right was that I went to a lot of meetings, but I didn't want to have a sponsor because I couldn't imagine calling someone at the same time every day. I couldn't imagine telling them what I was going to meet and that they could say, no, you can't have that. And also, I have a lot of uh, cardiac disease in my family. And I thought I needed to have this certain grain at breakfast, even though I knew that grains made me hungry. I still, anyway, you know, the insanity. And um, so I, I took the gray sheet. I went to meetings almost every day. And um, 
and I was, I had the food, I was eating the food plant, I would say 80%. And after about nine months, I had lost all my weight. And that's when I found myself eating out of the garbage. It scared me to death. I saw my, my, my reflection in the kitchen window and it scared me. And so I know now, and enough had kind of gone in through osmosis without me even realizing it, that I got that this is a disease, that it's a progressive disease and that I cannot do it by myself. I cannot do it by myself. I have to get a sponsor. And um, when I called someone, she said, I, I didn't want to call her at night. You know, it was eight o'clock at night. I didn't want to bother anybody. So I called her in the morning and she said, I can't talk right now. I'm on my way to work. Call me back in an hour. And in that hour, I did this flip flop. Like, why am I calling her? I feel fine. I, what? You know, thank God I did call her back. But what I know now was I wanted relief. That's what I wanted, relief. And as soon as someone said they would sponsor me, I felt fine. I felt better. But I did call her back. And she. it was so simple. That's the thing about this gracious abstinence. It's so simple. Not easy, but simple. Just give me your food. So I told her my food for the day. And then she said, you are abstinent. I was like, what? Wow. I was like on cloud nine for about four years. You are abstinent. Um, and, and the longer I'm abstinent, the more I realize how simple it is. It all boils down to don't eat and go to meetings. That, that's what it boils down to. Because at some point, sooner rather than later for most of us, a few weeks, maybe a few months at most, but usually a few weeks, we get through the withdrawal. But as the big book says, most of my disease centers in my mind. And even recently, I had this sort of tug of war in my mind about, um, I had, uh, I thought I finished lunch and I was sitting there and it had been a while had passed. And then I saw this little teeny bit of protein on my plate and I wanted to pick it up and eat it. I was like, well, I weighed, measured it, it's part of my lunch. It was like, but lunch is over. I, lunch is over, Kathy, lunch is over over but it was this real tug of war it was like a battle of the will eat this no anyway so the disease is still there it comes much more subtly with time but it's still there and that's what i have to remember i always have this disease it's incurable it never goes away it does push-ups in the hallways so but the thing is how do i how do you the, the trick really is how do you stay abstinent i mean how do you get abstinent you get a sponsor, you commit your food and you weigh and measure one meal. So you, we can do that, right? Anybody can do that. Just people say to me at a meeting, how do you get abstinent? I would say, you're gonna go home and you're gonna weigh and measure your lunch and you're gonna eat it. And then you are abstinent. That's all we have to do. So then it becomes the question, how do I get from breakfast to lunch, lunch to dinner and dinner to breakfast? That was always the hardest part for me, dinner to breakfast. And that's where it gets hard because if I've just had three abstinent meals in one day, there is no way that I am physically hungry. But the disease talks to me. It really tells me I'm hungry or I, I have to eat something because I will feel better. Even if there's nothing bad going on in my life, I can get this like, I gotta eat that, do something, put something in my mouth. And it's, it's a lie. It's a lie, it's all, it's not true. So how do I get through those terrible moments or all, those cravings, those food thoughts? Because we're all, we all have them. It's normal. Later, they, it does ease up. It gets so much easier. So I promise you, it gets easier. Just keep coming and keep doing this because it gets so much easier. But the, but the most normal thing in the world for me is to have these thoughts because I'm a compulsive overeater. So how do I not eat? Well, first of all, going to meetings and hearing and saying I'm a compulsive overeater and I am abstinent. And then we always say at the end, don't eat no matter what. That phrase, because if, before I got abstinent, I would hear... Like, you know, eat, 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 I want to eat, I want to eat, eat, eat. And after a while, the phrase don't eat would pop in. And in that moment, when that phrase pops in, I have a moment where I can make a choice. And that's where abstinence steps, steps in. That's where abstinent muscle kicks in. That's where recovery kicks in. I have a choice. Because before that, I don't have a choice. But in that moment, I can choose to either pick up the food or not. And how do you not? Well, there's, we can get on the phone, make a phone call, get on my knees, ask for help, do anything, jump up and down, do anything it takes, but just don't take that first bite. And 
The truth is, I was told those terrible cravings will not last more than 20 minutes. So if you have to stay on the phone for 20 minutes, you have to take a shower, or whatever you do, the craving will pass. It will come back and then it will pass. But I had never had the experience before that the craving would pass. I really felt like I was going to die if I didn't put something in my mouth. And I started to have the experience of not dying. That, I mean, that's like light dawns on marble. Most people know that, but I really didn't have that experience of knowing that. And the longer I was abstinent, the more I wanted to be abstinent. The other thing that really helped me was like just for today, just for today. I could not imagine going through life without a certain food. I could not imagine how I was going to get through Friday night, you know, out on a date or a wedding on the weekend. How, how, I couldn't imagine that. And my sponsor would remind me, well, it's not today. Just get through today. If I stay abstinent today, tomorrow's abstinence will take care of itself. I can wake up today. What am I going to do today to take care of my abstinence? I'm going to get on my knees, ask for help. I'm going to call my sponsor, commit my food, make sure I have everything I need. Um, and commit specific, not generic, because committing generic allows a little space for the obsession to come in. Well, I could have that. Oh, I want that. Or maybe I'll do that. No, just commit specific food and don't make changes unless I get sick or something has gone bad with my food. Or if I get an opportunity to go out to dinner, let's say I've committed my food and then someone calls and says, I want to go out to dinner. I can do that. I can just call my sponsor or somebody else with 90 days and recommit. Um, but the, that foundation, and one time I remember, now it would be a little bit easier, but I remember it was pre-microwaves and everything. And I went to a meeting after work. So I got home about eight o'clock at night and I had committed a certain protein I had forgot to defrost it. And so I called my sponsor and I wanted to change my protein. And she said, no, you committed it. You go to the grocery store and buy some more. And I thought she was crazy. I was swearing at her all the way to the grocery store and back. But that's what I did. And I, I never forgot that. And that was a long time ago. I never forgot it. But there was a fundamental lesson that I had to learn there, that I was not just on a diet or not just following a food plan. I have a disease. And this disease is about um, breaking the back of addiction. And like any good addict, I like to do things my way. I think I know how. I think I know better. I think I have the experience, you know, blah, 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 blah. When it comes to the food, I have to remain teachable. I have to be dumb around the food. And I have to call, even if somebody else would think, it's so obvious, why do you have to call about that? Well, because I'm a compulsive overeater. Somebody else could call me with the same question and I could answer it for them. But for myself, I cannot answer that question. And sometimes, because I, I don't really, I wouldn't really know what to do. And even if I thought I knew what to do, it's dangerous territory dangerous don't even take a chance it's not worth it and whenever i've called someone they never no one has ever said to me i can't believe you're calling about that no one has ever said that they would say thank you for calling and do this and i say that same thing to people and i mean that wholeheartedly and i know i have just about a minute left so i'll wind up um, and that's why i cannot do this alone and that's the whole thing why this is different from a diet or any kind of food club and, and the other thing I'll just say is that we're not here to make friends. I have made friends, but I have to, um, I'm here to get well. This is a disease that is based on an allergy and a disease of the mind. And so we don't need to hear each other's last names, uh, professions, family problems, food. I, we can help each other with the food. And so that's why I'm here. I want to get help. I want to offer help and, um, and I don't want to eat. So thank you very much. And no matter what.